Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, Damascus. So let me mention right off the bat that I'm going to break this up into several videos. The first will focus on the basics of forge welding and building layer count. Then we'll talk about various pattern development strategies in the second video. Now, if you've seen some of the crazy Damascus that people are making these days, you'll probably be itching to get busy on that right out of the box. But look, unless you totally master the rudiments, you're just kind of going to run into a lot of snags as you move forward on doing Damascus. So, the first is just going to be basics. Today, how to make hot steel stick to other hot steel. All right, a few preliminaries before I get started. First, definitions. The term Damascus steel today is used to describe steel which is composed of a large number of layers which are forge welded together and then generally manipulated in some way to create a pattern in the surface of the steel. A better term to my mind is pattern welded steel, but that's an argument for another day. So let's talk about our materials. The key to pattern welded steel is that steel must be composed of steels which will contrast with each other when polished or etched. There are many ways of doing this, but typically in modern Damascus blades, smiths use a high carbon steel along with some form of nickel steel. Because nickel resists acids, it remains bright when etched. But another more old school approach is to use two steels with dramatically different carbon levels. This will result in a subtler pattern than using nickel. Now, if you're looking to make Damascus for a uh, hunting knife or something of that nature, a modern, you know, western type knife, I'd recommend using a high carbon steel like 1080 or 1095 along with a nickel steel called 15N20. You can buy both of these from places like Admiral Steel and from most knife makers supply houses. That said, my bread and butter is Japanese style blades. For Japanese blades, I don't want a super in your face kind of pattern, so I typically use 1050 and 1095 steels, resulting in a subtler pattern. But whether you go the nickel steel route or straight carbon steel, the basic principles are gonna be the same here. I should point out that this is a project that assumes you've already made some knives and are now moving on to forging your own steel. You'll need an anvil and a forge capable of reaching around 24 to 2500 Fahrenheit, or around 1350 Celsius. The other key piece of equipment that you really can't do without is some kind of power squashing equipment. Back in the day, a master smith had a couple or three burly apprentices who'd thrash away with 20-pound sledgehammers. But today, smiths use power hammers or forge presses. One of the big rookie mistakes is trying to make Damascus without the right equipment. Look, I don't want to discourage you from trying this stuff with a hand hammer, but in the end, if you're really serious, you'll need a little more mojo than your right arm can provide. Some people try making Damascus with treadle hammers and screw presses, but honestly, these don't really have what it takes to do the job right. If you're thinking about gearing up to make Damascus, the forge press is the most budget-friendly way to go. So, let's get started making some stuff. Different guys use different thicknesses of stock. The thinner the stock you start with, the more layers you can build up in a short period of time. I use 1 8 by 1 inch stock, but some people use other sizes. This just happens to be my method. First I'll clean off all the scale from my stock on the belt grinder. When you buy steel from the mill, it's covered in black iron oxide, also known as magnetite or mill scale. Iron oxide will not weld, so you have to get rid of it. This is very tedious, but if you don't get rid of every last bit of it, you're liable to end up with poor welds and inclusions that will spoil your steel. Just as a side note, when I first got my belt grinder many moons ago, I was a little scared of it because I was afraid of running my fingers into it. Now, of course, I've mastered the machine, and I never run my fingers into it. Ever. At all. So...
All right, once I've cleaned it up, I'll cut the stock to length. For this project, I'll be cutting them off at seven inches. You'll need to adjust the length to fit your needs and your forge. In this case, I'll cut 24 pieces, 12 of 1050 and 12 of 1095. Make sure you mark them so that you know which ones are which. I just run marks down the side with magic markers so that when I stack them up, it will be unmistakable which one's 1050 and which one's 1095. I do nine little marks for 1095, five little marks for 1050. That's just my little thing. Nothing worse than getting ready to stack up your steel and then realizing you're not really sure which steel is which. Once they're cut and marked, I'll stack them up in alternating layers. Then I'll clamp them together and tack weld them together with my MIG welder. If you don't have a MIG welder, you can wire them together with iron wire. If you do that, you'll need to use a thick piece of stock on the bottom, say a quarter of an inch thick, as a handle. I'm going to weld up each corner, running a bead right straight down each corner. Then I'll weld on a handle. Something to be aware of is that any weld material that gets into the billet will contaminate it, leaving bright little streaks, so don't overdo the welding. Just enough to keep the billet from busting apart as it expands during heating. Once I've got the billet welded up, I'll crank up my forge. Once the forge gets hot, I'll put the billet in. I should mention that I have a sort of jack-of-all-trades forge that works well for forging swords, but it's not that great for making Damascus. If I did tons and tons of Damascus, I'd build a vertical forge which would be better suited for Damascus. Still, this one gets plenty hot and still does the job. So, before moving on, let me mention the three keys to successful Damascus. First, clean steel, no oil, no dirt, no scale. Second, plenty of flux. And third, high heat. Now, we haven't mentioned flux yet, so let me go into that a little bit. The function of flux is to dissolve the constantly forming layer of oxide off the steel so that when you squash the billet together, you get perfect steel-to-steel -steel contact between clean steel. I use anhydrous borax as a flux, also known as forge borax or anti-borax. You can buy forge borax from blacksmithing supply places, but 20 mule team borax from the grocery store will work fine too. The only difference is that there's water in the grocery store borax. That water turns to steam once it goes into the forge, causing the borax to sort of blossom up off the steel, and often it falls off or blows off, so it's a little trickier to use. But still, grocery store borax works just fine. So, I heat the billet until it starts to glow a little, then I'll pull it out and sprinkle it lightly with flux. If you try to put the borax on before the steel's hot, it won't stick to the steel and it'll just blow off into the floor of your forge. But don't wait too long or you'll get scale buildup that could contaminate things later. As the flux melts, it flows and covers the whole billet. You want a nice wet layer of flux around every single inch of the billet. Capillary action will draw it right through the layers. I usually hit it up with a couple more spoonfuls of borax as it's coming up to temp, just to make sure that it doesn't boil or drip off. Maybe it's overkill, but hey, I'd rather waste a little borax than end up with crappy welds. Now just so you know, borax will absolutely eat the lining out of your forge. So just be aware that over time, you'll have to reline your forge if you do a lot of forge welding. Now, some guys have forges dedicated exclusively to forge welding for precisely this reason. I just line the bottom of my regular forge with satanite, which lasts longer than KO wool and things of that nature. But do be aware that if you put something like satanite into your forge, it's going to absorb a lot of heat and make the forge less efficient. But it saves me some effort in maintenance. And I hate maintenance. So. What you're aiming for is basically a white heat just short of melting the steel. Now you can't necessarily rely on your eyes though. A temperature that looks white hot indoors looks sort of bright orange in the sunshine. So what you have to do is rely on the appearance of the surface of the steel. 
After a while, you'll start to see the flux boiling on the steel. At first, it'll be a sort of slow, sticky boil. You want it to look rapid and wet, sort of like bubbles on the bottom of a boiling pan of water. I also like to see an occasional steel spark flying out the front of the forge. When that happens, it means you're running nice and hot. UV protection for your eyes is a good idea. Staring at white hot steel is really bad for the eyes. You'll notice that in this video, I repeatedly switch from dark safety glasses to clear depending on what I'm doing. Unfortunately, it's basically impossible to get a really accurate video picture of the appearance of the steel when it reaches forging temperature. In order to see the bubbles boiling, I have to stop down my camera a little, which gives the steel a much darker appearance than it does to my eye inside my shop. But, anyway, this is the general look of the dancing bubbles you're shooting for. Just be aware that if you're doing this indoors, it will actually appear white to your eye. That's what you want is that nice white hot steel. If you're outside, different story, more of an orange color. So once I reach welding heat, I like to hold the billet up off the floor of the forge and rotate it a little in front of the flame. If you've got a vertical forge, this isn't an issue as you'll have the billet suspended off the floor anyway. Rotating it like this ensures even heat movement of flux into all parts of the billet and really gets it right up to maximum heat. Once the billet's screaming hot and the borax is boiling energetically, I'll pull out the billet and press it very gently and very quickly in the press, making sure that every section of the billet gets enough pressure to set the weld. Some people prefer to set the weld with their hammer, rapidly tapping all the way around the billet. That works fine, but I don't have any problem getting good welds in the press. I do recommend preheating your dies, though. Just stick a piece of stock in the forge, get it red hot, then close up the jaws of the press, and it'll absorb the heat. This way, you're sucking less heat out of the outer layers of the steel, making it weld better. No matter what, though, you want to set that weld super quickly while the entire billet is at welding heat. The welds are still weak. So if you get too aggressive, you can cause them to shear. First time out, we're just sticking that weld together, not moving it. Once I've set the welds, I immediately flux the billet and jam it back into the forge as fast as possible. Now you'll see people just blast away and start drawing out the billet immediately. But I feel like giving it one more heat at welding temperature will make the welds less likely to shear and give you a better product in the end. If you've done it right, it'll come back to a welding heat pretty quickly. Now I'll gently squash it in the press again just to make sure. I want to be dead sure I've set those welds all the way down the billet. Next I'll usually flip it 90 degrees and square up the billet. This is a good test. If the welds haven't really set, the whole thing will start to pull apart here at this point. Then you go cry a little and kick the dog. You can try refluxing, re-welding, and dicking around with it if you want, but I'm telling you right now, I've never had a lot of success trying to fix really rotten welds. If the welds don't take first time around, you did something wrong. Regroup, rethink, then start over. Or at least be prepared to grind a lot of steel off your billet. Next, I'll start drawing out my billet. As you flatten it, if there's even the slightest play in your dies, it'll tend to slip sideways a little bit, forming a kind of diamond cross section. Before that happens, you'll want to fix it. Just turn it 45 degrees and push the whole thing back to true. Once it's trued up, you can get back to squaring everything. 
So, two ways of building up layer count. Way number one, the old school method, is to use a hot cutter of some sort to cut the billet in half and then fold and re-weld. You can do it with a hot cutter on the press or you can use a hardy tool like this. Actually, you don't cut the billet all the way through. Instead, you cut it almost in half, leaving a thin web of steel where you cut. Too thin, it breaks in half. Too thick, it won't fold over. An eighth of an inch is about right, give or take. Before folding, you want to do everything you can to clean the interior surface, that is, the one that you'll be welding together. So after I hot cut the billet, I'll cover it with flux and stick it back in the forge. Well before it hits welding heat, I'll pull it out and use a wire brush to clean as much scale off as I can. I don't have footage of that, but it's very simple to do. Depending on how dinged up it looks, I may lay it face down on the anvil and hammer it a little to get it as flat as possible. If I don't like the look of the thing, I may even reflux it and rebrush it one more time. Or I may even hit the grinder a little. All depends on how it looks. Then I'll sprinkle yet another layer of flux on the interior surface and fold it quickly over. Then hammer it lightly shut. I'm not trying to weld it here, just trying to get the surfaces to mate as cleanly as possible. One thing to note, if you're using a nickel alloy, nickel oxides are very hard to get rid of and borax flux won't necessarily do the trick. You may need to pull the billet out and hit the face of the billet with the grinder. Some people like doing it with an angle grinder. That's a good method too. All right, so once I've folded it, I've fluxed the whole thing, put it back in, and bring it up to welding heat again. Depending on how many layers I want, I repeat this until I hit my target. Simple math, starting at 24, one fold doubles it, gets you 48, double it again, 96, a third fold, you get 192, and so on. Okay, so that's the old school approach. Now, what I'm gonna show you next is the approach that I generally use. For me, this approach, even though it's a little bit more of a pain, it takes more time, uh, it takes more effort, but weld after weld after weld, it gives you better results. At least it gives me better results. Here's the alternative method. Instead of cutting the billet while it's still fairly thick, I'll draw out the billet on my press. So let's talk about drawing. By drawing, we just mean stretching the steel out. Now, if you're thinking about getting into this and you don't yet have a hammer or a press, one thing to know is that you'll need dies intended for flattening and you'll need dies intended for drawing the steel out. These can be moved in and out of the face of the tool to achieve different results. The flat one obviously is flat and the drawing dies are domed. If you really get into Damascus, you'll get some more specialized dies like squaring dies, but we won't need them for the project we're doing in this video. You'll notice that after each pass as I'm drawing it out, I've flipped the blade. This keeps it from bending too much due to the slight difference in the profile of the top and bottom dies. Then I generally go at a 45 to 60 degree angle. This is more related to pattern development and not because it's the most efficient way to draw out the billet. We're doing a random pattern Damascus and the more different patterns that I drive into the face of the steel, the more interesting the pattern is going to be ultimately. So, I draw it out until it's fairly long and fairly thin. If it starts curving out of whack, I'll true it up a little with the hand hammer. Then it's back to the flattening dies. Flatten it, square it, true it up. One thing you'll note as the blade gets longer is that you can't heat the whole thing in your forge, so you have to work it in sections. This will be totally dependent on the nature of your forge. Depending on what you're doing, you may quit after the first pass, but we'll be doing what's known as random pattern Damascus, which requires a fair number of layers to result in an interesting pattern. So we need to build up more layers. I usually go about an inch and three quarters to two inches wide and about 15 to 18 inches long. That just happens to be a comfortable length for drawing out the size billets that I make. 
nothing particularly magical about those numbers. The most important point is that I want the width as even as possible. So, I'll measure it with these rusty old calipers. The point is not that it be 1.937 inches wide or whatever, but that it be a relatively consistent width from end to end. You'll see why in just a minute. I'll also want it quite flat. If necessary, I'll do a little adjustment with the hand hammer. The flatter I get it now, the easier things will be in the next stage. Sometimes you get gobs of flux on there, and they can cause divots in the steel as you hammer it to the final shape, so scrape off any flux that might cause you trouble. A wire brush will help knock off some of the thicker scale too. Now, I let the billet cool. Look, you can see the layering right here. Now I grind all the scale off. I like to grind the edges a little in order to make sure that I don't have any problem welds. Not too much, I'm not trying to waste any material, just want to see what I got. If I see any problems, I can just grind them away until I reach solid welds. What I'm doing here is basically the same approach I took with the original bar stock. Dead clean and as close to dead flat as you can get. Be a Nazi here and make this sucker clean, clean, clean. Do whatever it takes. One little bitty piece of scale left on the face there can leave a divot that will turn into a problem weld and then that'll stretch out and it can be a very big, long, ugly inclusion that will ruin your blade. If you have to grind a little extra, so be it. Nothing sucks worse than putting 40 hours into a knife and then finding out as you do the final polish that you've got a bad weld that you can't polish out. Believe me, I know this from hard, hard experience. Every rookie mistake you can make, hey, I've done it. Also, make sure that you grind off any residual weld material from tacking the billet together. Now I'll divide the billet into five pieces and cut it up with an angle grinder. Normally I'd use my abrasive chop saw, but hey, it died on me just before I shot this video. That's bladesmithing. The more tools you get, the more stuff there is to die on you. Notice that I leave a little extra tab on the ends of the billet. Now I could just cut them off. See the worst parts of the weld are always at the ends of the billet. Whether you cut them off or not though, you're wise to be aware of where the ends of the original billet were and to bury those ends inside the billet, both facing in the same direction. That way, any problem welds are least likely to show up in the final blade. You can cut these tabs of crappy steel off if you want, but I actually like to use them as a sacrificial piece on the end where I can attach my handle. That way, at the end, I'll cut off a goodly chunk of the final billet, eliminating problem welds and any MIG weld inclusions that might have ended up in the steel, leaving all the good stuff for my blade. Next, I'll stack up all five pieces that I've made and tack weld them together again, just like I did the first ones. As before, I'm using the absolute minimum amount of weld material possible. Then, fire up the gas and forge weld the stack exactly like you did the first one. Just repeat that stacking and welding however many times you need to reach your desired layer count. In my case, I'm usually making a Japanese blade in a random pattern, so I need about a thousand layers. But if you're doing a more modern style, most likely you'll use fewer layers than that. Well, you might ask, exactly how many layers do I need? Well. The answer is, that kind of depends. The question is, what kind of pattern are you attempting to develop? Now, in part two of this video, we'll talk about all kinds of fancy patterns you can develop. But for this one, we're just doing random pattern Damascus, meaning that we're not really manipulating the pattern in any particularly strong way. We're just layering it up and then letting the natural pattern of the steel develop. In part two of this video, we'll talk about pattern development and some of the fancy stuff that you can do with it. I mean, there are a million tricky things you can do with Damascus, 
But for this project, we're just doing random pattern Damascus, meaning we're not really manipulating the pattern at all. We're just layering it up and letting any pattern in the steel develop naturally. If you're doing a stock removal western knife, like a Bowie or something of that nature, where what you're aiming for is a kind of rustic, funky look, you can probably do fine with somewhere between, oh, 100, 200 layers, something along those lines. But for what I'm doing, I want more like a thousand. Okay, if you did everything right, you now have turned what were once 24 pieces of steel into this. A single piece of steel with a ton of layers. So we can repeat this stacking and refolding until we get wherever we want to be. Once we reach that requisite layer count, we forge out the blade one more time. In my case, I'm going to forge it all the way out to shape. So I'll forge it into a long thin bar first, preparatory to forging a sword. But you don't have to do it that way. If you want, you can forge your billet out to fit whatever blade you might want to make. Then just leave it in the forge, turn off the flame, and give it a rough anneal. That way it's ready for stock removal. Here's the result of our first billet. Now at this point you've got a lot of options. I've forged one piece that I'll be making into a sword with a thousand layers. So as we've seen I've gone ahead and forged it out into a long thin piece of stock. But this other piece is closer to being something I'd use for stock removal. If I wanted to do that I'd flatten it out just a little more, say down to about a quarter of an inch thick, then grind a knife directly from that billet. If I go that route, I'll want to grind the blade flat and get rid of any residual weld material from the tack welding, as well as bad welds in the handle area. As I said earlier, this area is basically sacrificial, because the pieces around the handle continue squashing together when they're not at welding heat, there will be substantial areas of bad welds in here. This isn't a result of poor technique, it's just a normal byproduct of this process. You just have to understand that those bad welds will be drawn out several inches and so you want to cut or grind them as far as you need to go to eliminate them. And there we have it. One billet for a sword, another that we can flatten out a little more and use to make a couple of stock removal knives. Or I can set it aside, grind it off later, restack, re-weld, and turn it into a Japanese style sword. Take a wild flying guess which one I'll be doing. So you may wonder what the results of all this work are. Frankly, if you're keeping it in the 100 to 200 layer range, it's not going to be that interesting. I really recommend that if you're going to be doing western knives, hunting knives, bowie knives, things of that nature, you're going to want to go the extra step and do some further pattern development and that's what the second video is going to be all about. But here are some examples of what the thousand layer Damascus looks like in the form of some of my Japanese blades. Okay, that's it for the rudiments of forge welding. Now, truthfully, you've learned most of the hard stuff. In the next video, pattern development. The techniques will be the same, but you'll add twisting, grinding, uh, chopping, squashing, and some other things to create a bunch of complex and interesting patterns. By the way, if you're really into this topic, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com. Eventually, I'm going to put together a very extensive video series on all aspects of Damascus making, including canned steel and twists and all kinds of stuff, W patterns, some of which is not going to be available here on YouTube. Next uh, video, pattern development, is going to have a lot of that information for you. Not sure exactly when that's going to come out, but should be out pretty soon. Thanks for watching.